Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to introduce our guest today as a personal mentor, inspiration, and leader of the light in the darkness, which is, or until he rocked up, was nutrition and health. This human was ahead of the curve before curves were recognized. Joel Green, ladies and gentlemen, has blown the doors off nutrition and shown us the way forward. Thank you, Joel. Uh, my only rational conclusion is that he was sent from the future to save us from ourselves. In fact, I think I recognise him from the spaceship. Um, he has de-dogmatised dogma, questioned even the most basic of principles, glucose transport to name but one, and shown us the big wins where to focus, in which order, and how to apply health tools effectively. If you have the remotest interest in dramatically improving your health and longevity, easily, effectively, and without the hope disappointment cycle we've all been through, associated with every other diet out there, then look no further. Pause this podcast right now and buy his book, The Immunity Code. Uh, better still, join his coaching course and help yourselves and <coughs> others around you. In fact, stop being selfish. Do the world a solid. Um, we need you and Joel to show you how. Um, today, Joel, you have really kindly made space in your busy sh schedule, Saving the Planet, to talk to us about fasting, which is probably one of the world's misused super tools. Um, and, you know, Joel, before we jump in, uh, a couple of things. One, just to show people that we are what we preach here. Or oh, thank gosh. Around, this is my copy of the immunity code, ladies and gentlemen. It's more dog-eared than my dog's ears. There's more notes in this than uh, than a teenager's Kama Sutra. And frankly, you you really need to get involved in this. Um, but I thought of you, moving on from the Kama Sutra, Joel, um, <laughs> is that um, I heard Dr. Diane Goodnow of Plasmologian fame say, to, say only the other day, Natalie did Diane's podcast, don't feel threatened, we've been stalking you from afar. Um, <laughs> we don't have a lack of science, we have a problem applying it. And that made me think of you, I thought, golly, Joel, one of your superpowers, apart from deep diving and throwing a rational set of eyes on things, is making things applicable. And you know, and showing people how to integrate it into their lives. And, and this is why I guess fasting is a is a great topic for us to cover. So, Joel, um, before we jump in, what have you eaten for breakfast today? So I am doing my amplified fast today, uh, which ah. is a very, very short fast. Um, yeah. So I'm going I'm to eat around noon probably. But uh, I, so I actually got cold and did my small molecules and um, did my uh, yesterday perfect nail through of um, basically spinning up the commensal bacteria, which uh, mimic and amplify fasting. So I'm kind of just doing my thing, essentially. Um, yeah. So that's what I've done. I haven't eaten yet. Nothing. Brilliant. What, once Are I you go still smiling? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I, well, the cold. The cold definitely gets you. You know, energized. One sec, uh, Ron. There's a uh, a box here that's picking up the sun as it's moving and i just let me uh let me just yeah, kick it yeah. out of the way here it's because it's blinding me <clears throat> oh so much better okay uh sorry about, okay we're good uh yeah so um and for those of you wondering what joel is talking about it's all explained in the book it's part of the immunity code two-day core diet which frankly has revolutionized my life I, I work in clinical nutrition as you know and I thought I knew what I was talking about until I read this book um, I've had countless success stories with clients and patients of this thank you Joel um, so why is fasting so important to someone's health and longevity well uh, at the high level if we look at um, what the body is best adapted to do, um, it's best adapted to have periods where it has food and then periods where it doesn't have food. And that's kind of it at the highest level. And they're both beneficial. We need both. And it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a two, two ends of a scale. 
where when they are in balance, the thing's perfectly balanced and it works great. Um, when you have too much of either one, you're going to see problems. So too much of, of food, for example, which has kind of been the, the case study of the last hundred years, you have, we just have we've got muchness, too much muchness. We've got too much food, too much, uh, too much of everything, you know? Uh, but so, so that's not good, but the converse can also be true. So too much of not having food too much. We call that starvation. And nowadays we call it fasting too much of that's not good. Um, but when they're in balance, when you have, uh, adequate amounts of both, then the human machine is optimized and it's optimized through opposing ends, opposing, uh, biochemical bio, bio processes it's optimized by, but, that's essentially kind of like the high level of it. So fasting in particular, um, essentially at the highest level, it helps us to just slow or stop aging because the business of living requires growth. And growth is a function of a number of things, all of them related to nutrients coming in the door. And when nutrients are not available, then the body goes into cleanup and repair mode, and that's very beneficial. And it has a, a number of beneficial effects across the body with respect to things like um, helping to ameliorate inflammation, helping to uh, essentially clear cellular junk and all kinds of things that we don't want in the picture. And so, you know, these um, these intermittent bits of uh, forced starvation, they're, they're a good thing. You know, they, they help us to just basically age better. And that really is the goal at the end of the day is that um, when you look at uh, the diets of this age, they're not specifically focused on optimizing lifespan. And so in the equation, um, we can factor fasting in to get an optimal between um, growth, which is essential, and um, slowing the clock, so to speak. So that would probably be like the, the kind of high level way that I think I'd, I'd describe it. But thank you. I think that was probably the most eloquent explanation of fasting that we've heard to date. Um, so what do you think when you see the plethora of mm. proponents of intermittent mm. fasting as mm. a, it's now being proposed, as a panacea for all mm. ills you know you want to change your eye color fast you want to be taller fast you want to mm. live forever fast mm -hmm. um i personally have seen a lot of people kind of blow themselves up metabolically uh, i've had clients and patients come mm -hmm. to me who really have changed their ability to process food mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um what have you seen and what would you decide as optimal now i appreciate we're all bio individuals but talk mm -hmm. us through that bit please yeah so to the first part of that you know what do i think about the plethora um my first response usually is just ah this is your first decade <laughs> it's your first decade doing this isn't it <laughs> because that's that's the truth that's what's going on um so I, 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 I did fasting in the early nineties and I have the, my story is the same as everybody else's that you'll hear post five years of doing it. Same story. Everybody has the same pattern, which is, um, first few years, amazing, amazing benefits were amazing, ripped to the bone energy, blah, 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 all this stuff. And then, uh, post five years, all kinds of problems, metabolic problems, uh, food intake problems, um, problems getting lean, all kinds of problems. And so that that let's use that as kind of a template to explain the whole ball of wax to everybody. So basically, there's no there's no proper um, understanding of fasting without sticking in a time frame. If you don't apply a time frame, if you if you treat fasting in the abstract, so it's just a word. Hey, fasting. What do you think? You know, oh, an abstract word. I like abstract words. I, if fasting as a word is great because it's abstract, it means nothing. Put it into a time frame now. Let's put it into a time frame and watch what happens. And what you're going to see is there's three distinct periods um, in any person's experience of fasting. So there's the benefits phase, which can last quite some time. It can last years. Um, then there is the attenuation phase, where it doesn't work the same as it used to. You just you know, you used to feel all these things and it's great, you know, and, but then there's a period where you're not really getting much out of it. 
um, it's neutral. It's not negative. It's not positive. It's kind of, but what the body is, so what's going on is the body's attenuating to it. And then you have the inversion phase. And that is, could be several years down the road. And now all of these, where there were once benefits, now there's just mostly negatives. Um, I had a conversation. I'm in a chat stream with uh, Mark Bell and Ron Penna, who owns uh, founder of Quest, and um, Carl Lenore, the, the great Carl Lenore from Superhuman Radio. And um, fasting came up the other day, and Ron called it um, fatting. He goes, you should just call it fatting. Because Ron has passed his first decade with it, and he's seen the same thing I've seen, which is long-term, um, more often than not, the deleterious effects overwhelm the benefits. And you begin to see things like it's uh, very difficult to get lean. It's very difficult to um, to eat carbohydrates. All kinds of problems you see. It just actually inverts. So that's the inversion phase. So you have the initial phase, which is benefits, the middle phase, which is the um, attenuation, and then the, the long term, which is the inversion. That's the, that's the template to understand fasting. And if you apply that to this, if you apply that to anything, if we apply that to any topic, we're going to get a much better understanding of how that thing works. Because one of the ideas that is missing from this era is the idea of applying how it works with respect to time. And what you'll see with the human body is if you throw anything at it, generally speaking over time, the way the body responds is going to change. Okay. Now with oh, fasting, wow. we can empirically show that's true mechanistically with fasting. And we just simply have to look at the mechanisms involved. So if you look at insulin and glucagon, and you look at production in the liver, okay, uh, of glucose, of gluconeogenesis, what you're going to see is distinct changes happening over time, okay? So let's say that you decide to take up um, low-carb, no-carb, high-protein, and fasting at the same time. That's kind of your thing. And that's very, very common. You see a lot of that nowadays, yep. okay? Yep. So what you're going to see is the benefits phase. So in the benefits phase, you're going to see an improvement in insulin sensitivity. You're going to see an increase in glucagon, Okay. Now, glucagon will suppress insulin output. Okay, so glucagon is the opposite hormone of insulin. It's going to suppress. It's going to suppress insulin output. So, in the benefits phase, it's like it's like it's like the it's like the the it's like the bloom on the rose of a marriage. I mean, everything's good, right? There's there's yeah. nothing bad about this, you know. But then, you know. 10 years into the marriage, you know, maybe, maybe it's like, wow, this isn't great. That's not, <laughs> you know, you start to get in different phases. Well, what happens over time is the longer you draw that out, you know, keep in mind, fasting is a word, but that word represents is not having food. The other word we used to use for that is starvation. Okay. Yeah. And we can, re we can readily show the effects of starvation on, on insulin function and a number of different things. So what happens over time is that as you elevate glucagon, over time and you have sustained elevated glucagon, then what happens is hepatic glucose output is going to decrease and you're going to get a decrease in peripheral insulin sensitivity. Okay. So yeah. basically what happens is that over time, glucagon begins to um, exert negative effects. Okay. And we think of glucagon as a good hormone, like, oh no, that's a great hormone. And you know, it helps us to get lean and lose body fat. Well, Insulin and glucagon are polar opposites. They work together. Um, you need insulin. Okay. You need insulin to be efficient. If you make too much insulin over time, then that's going to be a problem. Okay. The same is true of glucagon. If you're making glucagon too much over time, that's going to be a problem. Okay. So take the example of long term sustained excess carbohydrates where you're making too much insulin. Okay. At first, you don't notice it that much. Maybe it helps your workouts. You know, uh, maybe uh, it's just not a thing. But over time, what you start to see is too much carbohydrates, too much insulin production. You begin to get insulin resistant, and now over time, you get into the negatives. You get into the inversion phase, and then we have words for that. You know, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes. So take the opposite now. Okay, so continued starvation. Okay, we'll just, let's just call it fasting. Well, what's happening now is you're you're getting elevated glucagon over time. That's suppressing insulin output. Now you're getting a decrease in um, peripheral ins insulin sensitivity. So what you begin to see over time is a number of um, inversion effects that happen from from that you didn't see up front from doing it too long. Uh, not the least of which. Um, begins to happen in the gut. So uh, it's well documented that starvation wears down the gut lining. Like that's not even debatable. Just change the words out now and now use fasting. Well, you're going to see the same thing because 
Fasting is one of the ways you replete the gut bacteria acromancia. So what you see in the short term with fasting is it's very beneficial for the gut. You're driving acromancia. In fact, it's part of the immunity code. You have these little short bursts like I'm doing today, which is which we do in conjunction with commensal bacteria to spin up bifidobacteria on the day before. And then we kind of like um, accentuate the point with a little micro fast that helps acromancia. That's great. Doing it too much, the problem is acromancia works by eating the gut lining. And then the body responds to the MUSE2 proteins by making more uh, mucins. So the gut lining thickens. But if you have too much, then you overwhelm the body's ability to compensate and you wear the gut lining down. Too much acromancia. Okay. And that happens from prolonged starvation. You can see that from prolonged fasting. So all this to say, kind of this big long diatribe here, say that um, fasting is a tool. It can be no. incredibly beneficial. It's like any other tool. Like when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail and not everything yeah. is a nail. <laughs> and when you start using a hammer on things that require screws or things that require, you know, a drill, you're going to break things. Okay. When you treat yeah. it like that. Yeah. And so fasting is, uh, fasting is not a hammer. It's a selective tool. And when we use it selectively, we can build this amazing house that we call our body and we can make it work optimally. If you use it correctly, you just don't overuse it and abuse it. And the way you begin to understand that is to understand that it doesn't work the same at all points in time. And yeah, when you, when you talk to people who are in their, you know, their second five years or their second decade with it, it's common. I mean, you've seen it. We've all seen it. Oh yeah. I, I am single-handedly or rather I am <laughs> utterly convinced that fasting and low carb were huge contributors to my own personal burnout 10 years ago where interestingly i started to put on body fat overnight literally mm -hmm. i went from super lean just without even thinking about it somewhere between 10 12 percent to like 17 18 percent overnight mm -hmm. with with massive fatigue and storing it in really bizarre places like you know lower stomach and you go, oh. and of course, your first call is, I must be doing something wrong. I'm not working hard enough. And actually, you've probably just pulled the too many of the same levers too long um, and damaged yourself. I mean, a lot of and people that, come to me with with this, sorry, Joel, with, with this uh, with the same mindset. And they say, I don't understand it. I used to do this before, and it always works. Not thinking that exactly what they were doing is what has painted them into this metabolic corner. That is exactly, um, and that's documented. That's documented. You can go into the research and you can find sustained long-term low carb. Um, it'll give you diabetes, but that's how bad that can get. Okay. Sustained yeah. long-term low carb. So you're doing, you're doing long-term fasting, long-term uh, low carb, high protein. Um, you play that out long enough and the, the more common example is you just see like a really bad case of insulin resistance. Uh, but the extreme case is you see diabetes from that. Um, and what you see is, so basically insulin resistance is our gauge to understand when, when things aren't working because a highly insulin sensitive body is that person that can eat anything and they never gain weight. That, well, that's just insulin sensitivity. That's what that yep. is. You know, yep. you think, oh, you got an amazing metabolism. You can eat anything. No, he's just really insulin sensitive. Insulin resistant is no matter what I do, I can't lose weight. Well, that's insulin resistance. Okay. Insulin's yeah. not working. So we, so insulin has to work. And there are there's a number of, in fact, in my next book, I'm going to be highlighting this. There's a number of studies that show that these extended durations of these things that are very good and very beneficial short term, like the research on low carb, uh, high protein short term is fantastic. Like works great. Wow. Improves insulin sensitivity, right? That's the benefits phase. Uh, you keep doing it, keep doing it. Eventually, you hit the inversion phase where now you start to see insulin resistance from these things. So all that to say is we need a new lens and you have to put this lens over everything. And it's been missing. And this lens, just put it on, is how it works with respect to time. And once you get that, then that's going to keep you from tipping the boat too far over. Yeah. And yeah, so... Wow, I am. I, I, I'm literally. Even though I've heard this story from you before, I'm thrilled to hear it again. You know, it was explained so clearly and so undeniably that I hope. You know, my my goal, what golden looks like in this, 
is that some people who have been struggling with low carb, with fasting, who have been brainwashed by the media and influencers and uh, body models who are looking to lead the way, who have had, probably acting with good intent, you know, have had great benefits on it in the short term and have been brainwashed into this corner, actually get to save themselves from going any further. Because, of course, you know, we didn't mention fuser bacteria and potential cancer risks and, you know, from cutting out carbs and all of these soluble veg vegetable fibers. But you look at it and you think, the longer this goes on, the harder it is to row back up river to where you started out. And, I, you know, for some reason, there seems to be this kind of, I'm going to say it's a quasi religion or righteousness around food choices where people instantly think they're a good person or a bad person. They talk about clean eating and bad eating and treats. You don't treat yourself. You're not a dog. You give your dog a treat. You know, treating yourself is giving you <laughs> something that's going to nourish you. Right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah exactly yeah um i talked about this in the go ahead go ahead you're just on a roll no 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 100 please jump in <laughs> this, this is much yeah. better boat to row with two of us <laughs> yeah um yeah i in, i called this a dietology in the immunity yes. code which yes. which is um it's when people treat diet like it's a religion and there's this kind of sanctimoniousness to like you know your your choices and and the new sin becomes eating out you know people who don't do that like and you see this a lot with like the vegan carnivore thing you know they're oh, both bo both sides are you know hey, i'm not i'm not eating you know for ethical reasons and when someone says you know okay first of all like i love animals um yeah. i get this i get the side of it where it's like i wouldn't want to see an animal hurt but i'll tell you something like i grew up poor like I grew up, we, we lived in a housing project when I was growing up and we were poor. We didn't have food like four or five days a week. I'll tell you what, um, or at the end of the month, four or five days, we, we wouldn't have food on a regular basis. Um, you'll eat anything when you know. Okay. I know. The neighbor's cat <laughs> looks at you warily as you leave out. Yeah. I'm like, it's only from a high wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you watch my dog? So Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just the whole real religiosity to it is um it, it gets very conspicuous that there's a religious element going on here and at the end of the day we're, we're, we're talking about food and <clears throat> the opulence of this era and there's a there's an opulence to it in that there's an abundance that's never existed before like we have you know refrigerators stocked with food you know stocked with food that's that's gonna think about that for a second you know that's never existed Oh, thank you. Thank you for the wake up call. No, it hasn't. Yeah, that's, in fact, the refrigerator didn't even come into existence until the 1930s and they were sold door to door. That's an interesting side note. Um, imagine going door to door going, hey, you want to buy a refrigerator? Yeah, that guy was ripped. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah. So prior to that, there were limitations on how we could store food. And, you know, it was very much like you kind of got food as you needed it. And so this overabundance of food has taken us into this way of living that is atypical from the way humans have lived forever, forever. Non-seasonal. Exactly. Yeah. Around, but it's totally right. non-seasonal. Right. Yeah. So I, um, uh, in my upcoming book, I'm talking. I, one of the analogies I use is survival shows because you can see what really you can see our you can see base human on a survival show. Okay, <laughs> so, oh yeah. You know, drop you off on an island and you come in kind of with these dietologies of like you know I don't need this island. and it takes about a day or two and you're like man I'm gonna eat anything get get it in front of me you know so there's a there's some luxuries that have been afforded in this era that I don't I, I think it's dangerous to ever see them as anything else than luxuries, you know, because most people, even today in the world, um, do not have the, the level of abundance that, you know, modern cultures are just used to. They just, we're just kind of habituated to it, but that's, and so it spawns, I think it spawns kind of, uh, some of these dietologies, ways of thinking about food that are pure luxuries. I mean, the real truth about food is that if you really want to eat like our ancestors, 
half the time you're going to be eating outside of what you prefer to eat. You're going to be eating stuff you don't want to eat because that's all there is. That's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, it makes, whilst this makes total scientific and philosophical sense, it also makes me laugh. Uh, the, in terms of this <laughs> diatology, I mean, you know, personally, I, I know you're a huge advocate of empowering people so they can eat pretty much whatever they want um, by nurturing a very positive and resilient microbiome. I personally don't choose to eat gluten. I find it doesn't really agree with me. And I'm always wary of zonulin response and the effect of that on intestinal permeability. So I think, what, why take the risk? I remember being stranded in a North African airport for about 14, 16 hours. Man, I ate everything there was left on the shelf. I literally went in and it was a big arm scoop going straight across. Every, just worked my way through it. Didn't matter what it was in. Some milk powder and a camel toe. I'm in. Sign me up. I wouldn't normally drink that. Oh, that looks like it's got some calorific value. My brain needs you. You're my best friend. Come to me, literally, <laughs> just to, just to <laughs> empty my wallet, sat there and went. I remember sitting there and I thought, who has a sponsored smoking lounge next to the restaurant? And I will not name this airport. I sat there and there was just people smoking the way through it. Um, you know, open plan in the airport whilst I just ate things that I would advise people never to touch. And do you know what? I felt good on it. I felt sated. It got me through a day. It was exactly what we needed. Um, going on to back to fasting, and we've touched on a couple of things we could jump down a wormhole on. Uh, the vegan carnivore thing is a really interesting one, really interesting. And I think, you know, we need to maybe look at the whole concept of data around the carbon emissions, which have been, in my ideas, misstated around healthy ancestral style farming. But it, it, just to continue on the fasting thing for a moment, obviously people can pick up your book and there is a, a very clear and simple, easy to follow roadmap. And in fact, it's not the type of book you need to read cover and cover. It's I look at it like a toolbox. You, you pick it up, there are sections in there, and you go, oh, I can apply this tool, I can use this today. It helps if you read it sequentially, but frankly, you could pick up pretty much any part and then go, oh, okay, I can use this drill. This is the roadmap for drill without damaging myself. And if I want to know when I can use the drill, I go back to this part. So for anybody who's listening to this, don't try and read it like a novel. It's not a novel. It's a manual for better health. Um, if they're going to, anybody listening to this, how do you recommend they fast and how often? And this is, I know this is really as large as it is long. Yeah. Well, what I would say, it, it, yeah, I'm just going to repeat kind of what I've put in print, but um, basically we, we do need uh, regular periods of food cessation that should be in the picture and you can make a very good argument that once in a while we need longer periods of food cessation where we don't have food and that's a good thing so you know maybe you know once whatever once every six months once every three months maybe you need a longer period of food cessation but where we should begin with is what's the objective what are you looking to accomplish okay um if it's just kind of this um this roar shot of you know stuff on a wall like it's good i just want it to be good i just because it's fasting's good i just want the goodness that's what i want i want the chocolatey goodness okay <laughs> well okay um let's let's level that up a little bit here so generally speaking if we're gonna if we're gonna inventory and quantify the benefits that you're looking to get uh there you know we would list out a few things. We'll say, well, number one, you know, you probably want some benefits to body composition. You probably want some benefits to um, insulin function. Uh, you probably want some benefits to the gut. You, and what I would offer, probably the meta goal would be uh, help the body just age slower on a regular basis. If you could have three days a week where the body's aging at a different rate, uh, maybe 30% less than it is the other three days, that's the biggest benefit of all. 
And what you cannot afford to lose in the process is uh, insulin sensitivity. So you cannot, you cannot look at fasting apart from insulin sensitivity. And if you do, then you're dealing with 10 years ago nutrition. You're just dealing with Bush League, you know, like it, it's my first decade. <laughs> you're yeah. dealing with kind of kind of the low tier of application because insulin sensitivity um, is the thing. It's sort of the it's sort of the the balance beam upon which everything rests. And so as you go through your life, keeping insulin sensitivity working at a very high level is going to give you everything that you want. It's going to help you age better. It's going to help you stay lean, all that stuff. So fasting must be thought of in a context of insulin sensitivity. And so what I suggest is you begin the day before the fast. That's what I suggest. And the best way to do that is two things. Number one, you're feeding the body foods that stimulate key commensal bacteria in the gut that complement fasting. So that would be, um, and you really, it's really simple. You don't have to you don't have to like, you know, get into like, well, uh, oh gosh, there's crystallinsia and then there's, you know, clostridia. How do I get the, there's really just two. It's just bifidobacteria, that species and acromancia, and they're, they're actually quite easy to target. So that brings us to the other piece of the equation. So, so, and that question is, well, let's feed them. And the next piece of the equation is let's stimulate insulin and let's do it directly. Okay. So there's benefits to stimulating insulin directly because over time it keeps it sharp. So essentially the day before the fast, you want to be rich in phenols. You want to be rich in resistant starches. You want to be rich in key fibers like inulins and uh, hemicellulose. So represent those in the diet the day before the fast. I like to uh, time them. I like to add in the element of timing so that the more energy rich foods are earlier in the morning, I got a better ability to handle those. And then as you go throughout the day, you can mix in resistant starches and you can mix in, you know, key fibers. And I would put those, almost all of that, I would put under the bucket of less preferential foods. Okay. Like, but not actually, let's be honest. There's a lot of those aren't foods we prefer. And that is an important aspect of optimizing human health is that if you look at what humans have always ate, eaten, in order to be maximally robust and healthy, half the time you're eating foods you didn't want to eat, okay? Because there's nothing else. So the day before the fast, we're eating, we're getting those kinds of foods in. And then there's very ways to vary that. You can you can have days like that where you have higher amounts of protein with those fibers, which is very complementary, or you can go lower protein. And there's there's different reasons for cycling both in and out. You know, there could be training needs. It could be um, there could be uh, you want to just um, look at longevity a little harder. And so you're spinning protein down. So there's diff there are different elements to that day before the fast, but the one key constant is that mix of phenols and fibers. Okay. Now phenols and fibers and roots have a very interesting place in the equation because if you look at where they were historically utilized, it's foraging. Okay. Like yeah. for foraging. Now when you're foraging, what you're typically likely to find are roots. Roots are, and understand roots are the food of last resort. Like, like nobody's first pick on be, on naked and afraid is let's go dig up some roots. That's nobody's first pick. Okay. <laughs> Your first pick is, <laughs> you know, let's go, let's go find like a, like a wild turkey or like a, you know, like, like a, like a boar or something. Let's go get that. Okay. That's your first pick. Um, digging up roots. That's a last resort. Okay. So typically when you're in the foods of last resort, <laughs> there is when you're naked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Camera position essential. <laughs> you can squat and dig up roots at the same time. This is perfect. Stay on me. Stay on me. <laughs> right. All right. So in the hole you left where you dug the roots up, you can evacuate into that. So this <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Okay, we're going south there. It's getting better. So, um, yeah, back on track. Okay, so <laughs> um, all that to say, all that to say, like starvation and roots kind of go together. So do mushrooms, so do berries. These are things like you find in a kind of a starvation mode. Okay, so it turns out that those foods are complementary to fasting. They're complementary starvation. They actually, they actually drive the bacteria that help you get through starvation, that improve insulin function, that improve insulin sensitivity, improve the gut. Okay. So what we can see is that historically there's actually a really good sort of like um, list of benefits that were accidentally associated with 
eating less preferential foods in a starved state. And they help you, they help the body. And it, I mean, it's really not that surprising the way nature no. has kind of configured things, you know, like, like we shouldn't be too surprised to see that. So that being said, going into the day of the fast, you've turned up the signal pathways of fasting. You've turned up AMP-K and, you know, all these different um, autophagy. You've turned these things up through bacteria in the gut. So you've actually amplified the fast you're going to do. So you can, you can do it for a much shorter period. And then the way that um, I like to do it is to take modern science and add in small molecules uh, right in the first thing in the morning of the fast. So berberine, terastilbene, um, physotin, rutin, all of these marvelous compounds that are available to us now through science that essentially mimic and accentuate and potentiate all of the signal pathways and all the benefits of fasting. So the whole goal here is we're taking the window of fasting and we're bringing it down, but we're taking the benefits and we're amplifying the, the, the magnitude of those benefits within that window. That's what we're doing. Okay. So that we don't have to do it that much. So what we're doing is mitigating, we're mitigating that long-term phase where the inversion happens and the negatives happen. We're mitigating that by just not having to do it very much. And so that's basically kind of a, a pattern uh, of doing it. And then very short fast, you know, like noon, typically, um, sometimes I'll go to two or three and I add in cold with that. So cold is the perfect companion to that. And if you think about it, it makes sense in a starved state. First thing you're doing is you're up in the morning and it's cold and you're digging up roots. You know, you're trying to find food. You're, you know, hunting if you can get something, but you're just expending energy. It's cold first thing in the morning. That's, that's what we would do. So, you know, we mimic, mimic that. And so get, uh, you, you spin up bacteria the day before you get cold, small molecules fast for a short duration, and then repeat that wash, rinse, repeat three times a week. And what you can make a really good case for is that if you are eating kind of a, a low carb, a low, low, very low carb, uh, to no carb diet on those days, then you can actually stimulate insulin from the opposing direction. So insulin doesn't work alone. Um, insulin is like the magnificent seven. Okay. It's a team effort and, or it's, it's like a uh, Wyatt Earp and his, in his, you know, desperados, you've got the main figure, but then you have all these supporting characters. You have Virgil and Morgan. Well, insulin works that way. So insulin has other hormones that potentiate its action. And that would be the incretins, uh, GIP, GLP one, that would be adiponectin. That would be glucagon. All these hormones make insulin work better. Okay. Yeah. So you, you can begin to look at ratios of um, glucagon to insulin. You can look at adiponectin to insulin. You can look at um, uh, GLP-1. You can look at all these ratios. And so on the fasted day, we can stimulate those, those hormones. In other words, we can stimulate insulin indirectly, where the previous day we stimulated it directly with carbs. We can stimulate it indirectly on this day. And so, you know, the key, key food selections will do that. So we adding in, you know, your typical like keto looking foods like eggs and, you know, avocado and, and uh, nuts and uh, walnuts, things like that. And these foods have a direct effect on those helper hormones. So by balancing insulin with direct stimulation and indirect stimulation, combining that with uh, fiber, it's just a much better think through of this whole thing than the fasting's good, throw it to the wall, benefits, yay, you know, so. Joel, you know, um, it, it's utterly inspirational and motivational to hear you speak and explain this. And for, the, for those of you who are listening to this and going, wow, let yeah, let me just tell you, this is Christmas and Easter and summer holidays all rolled into one. It's a win. It's a win. It's a win. You get to eat loads of berries the day before. You get to eat... Uh, lots of things like cold resistant starches you get to eat food uh, which is very satisfying and you also get to fast for shorter periods of time with more benefits and zero downsides so yeah Joel's just given you a present and unwrapped it and showed you how to use it and you know Joel it's a huge thank you for that um and I guess this is a statement that I've used a few times when I've given your book as a gift or as a recommendation is it's the answer you, you never knew you were looking for. Um, and, and it really is. So many people are floundering around and I have been one of them at some point thinking, hang on, I'm doing all of this good stuff and I'm not seeing the returns I should be seeing. 
and you've shown how to apply that rubber to the road and get traction. Um, just jumping back on the vegan carnivore thing. That, why that, not? <laughs> why, why not? I mean, you know, I, I look at this and I'm an animal lover and uh, we have beautiful animals at home as part of our family. I can understand why people actually you know, they look at this and they go, okay, I'm reluctant to eat animals. That, you know, are religious reasons. I totally understand that. I support people's choice. You know, I'm all about empowered choice. As long as it never impacts negatively on other people, we should we should all be able to live collaboratively, uh, collaboratively as human beings. Uh, there seems to be some really dark, odd, misleading chat about veganism saving both your health and the planet. Now, I even saw vegan dog food uh, sold in one of our local shops. And I said to the lady very kindly, I was like, please don't do that. The obligate carnivores, you're going to kill them. And she looked at me and she said, no, 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 it's, it's much, much, much healthier. And I was like, you just don't have the insulin function to be able to digest that. It's not complete in amino acids. Uh, the soy is not a complete protein because whilst all the amino acids might be present, they're not bioavailable and especially not to a dog and a cat. I know it's well-intentioned. It, it's just not correctly applied. What's your take on this, John? Um, well, the challenge, the challenge when you are attempting to you know, tease out the benefits of anything that has been um, sort of deified or quasi religified is that we're in an age where um, I'm, we're trying to apply reason. And unfortunately, it's been tribalized. So, in the process of, of trying to go, hey, okay, so let's be objective. With both with, with this carnivore thing, with this uh, vegan thing, let's be objective. Let's let's inventory what seems to be great, what seems to be not so great. The problem you'll find is that both sides of that argument will readily accept the beneficial sort of you know um, impartations. Like, oh yeah, you're right. It's, that works. It's true. It's great. But then when you get to the the ne- now on the negative side, they're just like boom. You know, <laughs> like the. The uh, it, it's it, the religious wall kind of comes up and how dare you you know you get that kind of thing, um, so that's always the challenge with this thing. But I think it's important to it is important to kind of like you know be uh, to be um, analytical when it comes to looking at, at at veganism because on the one hand there's a lot of benefits to it. Yeah, you know we can objectively say there's a lot of benefits, and if we simply put on the lens of time like we did with fasting. We can now explain it in a very kind of coherent way, which is there's kind of that initial benefits phase, there's that attenuation phase, and then there's that negatives phase, and the negatives phase is way down the road. Okay, that's like a really good way to explain it. If you put that lens on, it'll make perfect sense. So, you know, in the in the benefits phase, for example, I've seen a lot of people who had, um, you know, very life threatening um, cardiovascular issues go vegan and completely heal everything. Okay, from doing that. Um, cleared up their cholesterol, unclogged their, did all these amazing things. Okay. And, and, and now they're massive adherents and they're like, well, vegan plant-based, it's the only way to go. It saved my life, blah, blah, blah. You know, you get all that. And those stories are true. Um, but what's equally true is that as you get, if you just simply put on the lens of time and you get down the line, well, now we can start to see some, some negatives are kind of coming from this. And I've seen them. I've, I've seen the negatives. Like when you see someone who's done that 20, 30, 40 years, you know, that they're just, uh, a lot of brain fog, um, from the lack of B vitamins and don't look good. I mean, just a whole plethora of issues that you can see related to that. So suffice to say that, um, the plants, confer massive amounts of benefits. Uh, far from the way that um, one side has tried to demonize them, there's a massive amount of benefits. Is it a complete approach to eating? No, because that's not what humans would do in the wild. Like just take a vegan, put them on naked and afraid, give it three months, and they're going to be eating like whatever gets in front of them. Even if it's game, they're going to be doing that. Okay. So 
in terms of like an optimal way to feed the human body, it's an imbalanced approach. And the problem is that homeostasis is how the body works. You can knock the body out of homeostasis through dietary imbalance. You can do things that you think are healthy and you just imbalance them, do them too much. And you can knock the body out of homeostasis and create problems. When you have um, a balanced approach to diet, uh, there's no negatives, no, none that I can, none that I've ever heard of when, when there's a balanced approach to diet. And so in particular with veganism, one of the issues you get into is you get into um, insulotropic protein. In order to get your protein in, you've got to stimulate insulin, you know, sig significantly very often, you know, like people are always asking me like for vegan choices of like, uh, sometimes it's very important to have a high protein meal, you know, like it's very good to get, you know, sometimes 30, 40, 50 grams of protein in a meal. It's doable. Um, it takes carbonzo beans to do it, you know, like, but it's doable if you want to do it in a, in a vegan way. And for carbonzo beans are actually pretty good for insulin function. Um, but generally speaking, if we can have, um, if we can get our protein requirements in without having to hit insulin as much as possible, that's probably a good thing long term. That's probably a really good thing. And so, and there's just lots of other issues to that. You know, there's, there's good reasons for eating um, animal based proteins, really good reasons for doing yeah. that. And yeah. again, you know, there's, there are people on both sides of this who are just completely polarized, one or the other. And it's very difficult to have a, like a, just a reason conversation. The same is true on the, on the, on the, on the meat side of the equation. You know, there's, there's a ton of benefits to having meat. Um, but, you can you can step into the negatives as well. I get those DMs every day from people who are three four years into you know a carnivore diet. One of the things that you do, which I, I really admire, and I, I hope more people take a lead from this, is you take an objective, non-tribalized view. So, guys, for those of you who are listening, please, uh, this is neither an attack on uh, veganism nor carnivore. You know what Joel and I are trying to do here is literally give you an empowered view on how this works biochemically and what this looks like on a longer time frame than simply now or next month and i personally have seen lots of patients in my practice who have turned to vegan and it may have solved one or two benefits and uh, i call this the theory of relativity and that is normally because they have metabolically painted them into something they didn't want to be on a previous junk food diet, then moved on to vegan. So relatively speaking, the vegan is substantially healthier than what they were eating beforehand. So they see all of these benefits, one, because of time, it's new to the body, but two, because they've removed all of these negative stressors, these sulfites, these processed meats, these cheap carbohydrates, these terrible things, which were convenient, which have actually forced them to look at a solution and put a set of eyes on this problem. And they turn to, insert panacea here, carnivore diet or vegan diet as an extreme to deal with the extreme health issues they have. And before you know it, they see benefits and people become very much advocates of what's worked for them in the n plus one experiment before seeing the end of the experiment mm, wow that is such a great way to put it that's um, brilliant you, you know the, the experiment's still ongoing let's talk about this next year and suddenly we see quite often i've seen personally lots of people with thyroid issues uh which get this and there's a mineral depletion there's a lack yep of and lots of people with the whole intestinal permeability and then chronic inflammation and they just don't understand why it is you know uh maybe 20 years ago now i i was raw vegan for a couple of years and my you know all with the best intentions yeah all with the best intentions um wow I mean, I, I, I was literally throwing muscle mass away and then suddenly energy with it as well. You know, mm -hmm. when suddenly a couple of months later you go, oh, wow, I, hear, I, I need a whole new wardrobe. Interestingly, it did very little to body fat. It mm -hmm. was just yep. taking you as you are, shrinking you down. Right. Yep, yep, yep. Um, uh, 
So, uh, well, sorry, Joel, you were about to say something there. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I had a thought, but I, I want to hear what you were going to say. Well, that, that's it. And I think uh, what we then see when people return to, I'm not going to say a normal eating pattern, is a huge metabolic rebound. Yes. Um, and also the, the, this is very prevalent in the pet food market where people are looking to, uh, yeah. you know, create a high protein food, but cheaply, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're using a lot of pea protein. Yeah, now, yeah. You, you know, yes, you can argue it might have full spectrum amino acids, but it comes with such an insulin load that dogs and cats are not, they're just not capable of, of, of dealing with that longer term. And I know with the right gut bacteria, you can deal with lectins, but in that proportion, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. I mean, no, not a dog. Everyone's team being resilient to and being simply these are overwhelming the castle walls of your intestines. You know, this is yeah. the hordes coming over the barbarians at the gate. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's not the small but small molecule berberines. That's the barbarians. But yeah, it's it, it, it's it's uh, it's Emperor Honora's watching the Visigoths charge. Yeah. Charge the seventh hill in Rome. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, so dogs, um, you can you can actually so an easy way to reverse engineer what any entity should be eating is just simply take a look at the bacteria that make that entity thrive, and then reverse engineer what foods create that. That's so such a good way of looking at it. With a dog, it's you can so we're killing dogs with plant matter. You're killing them. You're giving them cancer with plant matter, okay? Because when you look at when you look at what a dog thrives on, it's the exact opposite of a human. Uh, a dog needs massive amounts of fusobacteria in the gut, which for most humans will give them cancer and kill you, okay? But for a dog, they thrive on that. The reason is the dog is a pure carnivore, okay? And so with a dog, uh, meat intake will ferment fusobacteria in the gut. It's what they need. Their perfect diet is meat intake, and and so dog in his natural environment, wild dogs of Africa, all they do is hunt. Uh, they produce a lot of fusobacteria in the gut and it makes them thrive, makes them healthy. Okay. You start feeding a dog plant matter, you're going to mitigate fusobacteria production in the gut. You're going to make bacteria that are great for humans detrimental for dogs. So yeah. humans need humans need the byproducts of plant matter in the gut. They need bifidobacteria, which comes from phenols and uh, actually also dairy. You get it from dairy. Um, and acromantia, which comes from fasting and, and phenols. Okay. And that's what humans thrive on. Um, interestingly, uh, when you feed a human just, uh, just, just uh, the carnivore style thing, you begin to spin up fusobacteria in the gut. That's not good at all. That's not a good thing. Um, and interestingly, if you just simply take in a little bit of plant matter with the with the meat, you know, a little bit of asparagus with your meat, you negate the production of fusobacteria. So humans, you can reverse engineer that we're actually meant to eat mixed media in our diets. Like we're yeah. we're best when we have both. And you can you can literally just predict that by looking at your end products in terms of bacteria. Like you don't really want fusobacteria if you're a human. And you can negate it by just adding a little bit of this. So that tells you the structure where a dog. You want as much of that as you can get, and you start feeding them plant-derived products, and it's the worst thing possible. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly as a proportion, I do believe there's a a, a very small proportion actually helps with uh, gut transit, with yes. which, which helps with um, uh, some bacterial production, and there are right, some which which you know which they'll do when they're sick. They'll go and yeah. eat plants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to work out, in fact, which uh, plant, which, which bacterial strains are actually nourished by uh, Wellington boots and child's toys. But I mean, that's for another t another time. Um, that that's a study that's waiting to be done. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's do it. You eat that? I was just nurturing bacteria. Mm, not so sure. <laughs> I'm convinced about that one. <laughs> um, Joel. Respecting your time and respecting your you, thank you so much for being on today. Really, it means a lot to me. Uh, I have advocated and been a huge fan of yours 
And uh, frankly, the work you do is noticed. It's tangible. It changes people's lives and it makes them better people. When people have better energy, they think better, they're kinder to other humans, and they actually look after the people they should be looking after. So what you started off as maybe a, a, your own dietology, albeit based on biochemistry and fact, um, is really changing the face of the planet. So guys, please, please do look out for Joel's book. And Joel, where can we find you? Well, uh, first of all, thank you. You are uh, way too kind. <laughs> and I want to just say to your listeners uh, that Rowan is a brilliant, brilliant uh, clinician in his own right. And so, uh, you know, listen to this guy. He's got amazing things, amazing insights. Um, yeah, uh, Instagram is probably the best place to find me, although I am <laughs> I am now on Twitter and TikTok. Oh, uh, but wow. Instagram. Inside on major, yeah. Instagram's real Joel Green. Uh, you can find me. That's the best place. And then uh, I'm not, I, I got to do more on Twitter and TikTok. I'll get to it. But um, yeah, that's probably the best place to find me. Brilliant. Well, guys, just to make life super easy, I will put some links in the bottom of this podcast. Um, get the book, get the book and give it to somebody who has been struggling with their health. Watch it turn around. Uh, I use just anecdotally. Uh, I have two anecdotes, um, some of which are appropriate, but I guess the first one was the sleep. I've never, ever not used uh, Joel's sleep protocol to somebody phoning me up within four days and going, what the hell have you done to me? I've never slept like that before. And uh, we experimented with his testosterone protocol. Needless to say, there was lots of people phoning in talking about tents. Um, anyway... <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thanks for right, listening. Bro. Remember, Thank you. humans of planet Earth, you are literally, as the acronym states, hope. So be kind to each other and let's all learn from each other. Peace out. <laughs>